Want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Go to your local newsstand and pick up your free copy today. Looking for the training and skills you need to get a new career? Call Center for Training and Careers today. That's CTC at 408-213-0961 and start building your new career today. I'm Siwapili Rose Amador LeBeau, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited today because we have Larissa Garcia from the Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico, and she's family. So <laughs> welcome, Larissa. Thank you, Rose. And she is here because she went to Los Angeles to the American Indian College Scholarship Fund Dinner. Is that what it was? Yes, their 25th anniversary gala. Yes. And you were representing? Um, I was an alumni student ambassador. So I, my, uh, along with three current students um, from Diné College and Northwestern Indian College were um, representatives at the gala in uh, Los Angeles. And then you said they do this three times a year. They have big events or big. Well, dinners? they have an annual gala, but this year because it's the 25th anniversary, they have they have had one in New York City. Uh, the one in Los Angeles, and they've got another one coming up in Chicago. How exciting. So how was the one in Los Angeles? It was fabulous. It was um, a black tie event. Oh, okay. um, and so there were um, corporate sponsors there as well, um, Ford Motor Company, um, Comcast, uh, Walt Disney, um, that provide um, help provide funding towards the American Indian College Fund, who in turn provide scholarships for Native students. Okay, so you got a scholarship when you went to college. Yes, I did. Um, I received a scholarship via the American Indian College Fund when I was a student at Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute in Albuquerque, oh. and that is a tribal college. And so the um, college fund funds tribal college students, but they also help fund um, with scholarships for students who are also at mainstream universities as well. Do you think it made a big difference in your life? Absolutely. Um, one of the biggest barriers to college for Native students is um, financial assistance. Um, you know, the, with the growing rate and increase in tuition, um, that's uh, sometimes the biggest challenge that our Native students have in trying to get through college is because they just don't have the funding to do mm -hmm. it. And for a lot of students who are on reservation, the other barrier is distance to a right. university or college. And so um, there are some tribal colleges and universities that are on reservation, which help um, with easing that problem in terms of distance. But the financial assistance is probably the biggest help of all. Oh, I bet. Now, has there been an increase in the number of students they can assist over the years? Yes, there have. But there are also still thousands of students who aren't able to pursue a college degree because they just don't have the financial assistance to do so. And so I think the, one of the best things about the college fund is that they not only can help those that are attending tribal colleges and universities, but for those that are at mainstream universities throughout the country, too. And what school, again, you went to? Which I went to SIPI. And, and, what did, and what did you major in? In there, I majored in liberal arts. I have an associate's degree in liberal arts and an associate's degree in business management. Okay. Okay, and where do you see the, the majority of the students going now? You said a lot of the current students were at this dinner or... Yeah, well, actually, there were only four of us at this dinner that were student rep ambassadors to okay. this dinner. Uh -huh. um, but there are um, a wide variety of students throughout the country who attend these, uh, you know, universities uh -huh. okay. and uh -huh. that are owned and run by um, by tribes. And SIPI is just one of them in Albuquerque. Now, do most of the students that get scholarships are they from reservations or both off on? A majority of them are on reservation uh -huh. students. Yes, because they have limited, really limited access to. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So the college fund is a great um, helper in bridging that gap there for them. 
Now, you said you also represent your college going to speak for the uh, Native American Scholarship Fund. Now, yeah, tell well, me a little I, bit about that. I've done, I have done a couple speaking engagements before on behalf of the college fund um, in helping to seek potential donors who provide, um, who provide money to the college fund, and then the college fund then establishes um, and helps to disseminate these scholarships. So they receive the applications, they review them, and then they decide on who will be awarded these scholarships. So there are um, a number of um, corporations. Um, I had gotten, during my time at SIPI, received scholarships from AT&T, Ford Motor Company, General Mills, um, so big corporations of that sort as well make contributions to the college fund. That's good. Have they increased? Yeah. As a matter of fact, at the gala in um, in Los Angeles, uh, Walt Disney contributed two hundred and fifty thousand oh, dollars to the wow. college fund to help with scholarship opportunities. Are there um, Indian uh, colleges? Yes, there are. Tell so, um, like one is in Albuquerque. Um, a couple of them that the students that were with me at the gala. Um, two of them attend Diné College, so the Navajo Nation operates mm. their own colleges. And then uh, Northwest Indian College in the state of Washington, um, which is operated by the Tulalip um, community. So yeah, there are a number of um, colleges throughout the country. Sitting Bull has one, Menominee Nation has a college, um, the Aani Nakoda tribe has a college as well. So there are uh, you know, a lot of, of universities that are owned and operated by tribes. Oh, that's excellent. Now, do you see a lot more of our youth thinking about college or is it still a struggle to try and get the kids to go to college? I think it's still a struggle. It's um, a lot of it though I think is is not having the mentorship available um, in encouraging our students to go but I think once they find that encouragement and those that are willing to help them you know, because it's a, long, it's a lengthy process to go right. to college, you know, it's not... And especially if you have to go away from home. Right, exactly. And a lot of that is, um, you know, we have a lot of students who have never left the reservation, mm -hmm. and then we're expecting them to go somewhere and live away right. um, an, an, in an unfamiliar territory, and that's scary in itself. And so a lot of our students start and then end up, you know, getting homesick mm -hmm. or returning home at Christmas time during the break and then not going back. How supportive are the families and the kids going away? I mean, because I know it's it's hard for a lot of you know the families to say, "I'm going to let the my daughter or my son go away across the country or leave the reservation." Yeah, I think a lot of it is you know depending on on the type of lifestyle we live at home on the reservation. So more traditional families have a little bit harder time mm -hmm. letting you know their students go away to school mm -hmm. um, because. You know, in, in a lot of tribal communities, you know, family and extended family members help one another right. in the raising of children and the upkeep of homes and traditions and things like that. So when our students go away, you know, we lose those extra helping hands in, in that process. And so sometimes that can be discouraging as well. But I think we need to, you know, if we can help educate our community members as to mm -hmm. the importance of letting their children go to college, you know, that would be also helpful for them. So when the kids come back from college, do you lose them to the cities or do they come back? Uh, you went back to work with, with your people, but what's the norm? The norm is that the, there aren't enough jobs in our tribal communities to hire every college graduate that comes back home. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not feasible for them to be able to accommodate all of those and so those like in, in Acoma, where I'm from, we're about 60 miles west of Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of our community members who have college degrees but have to commute to Albuquerque because mm -hmm. the jobs just aren't available on the reservation to, to accommodate every college graduate. Now that would be ideal in any right. tribal community to do that, but sometimes that's just not possible. And so we do end up losing a lot of our college graduates to, to other places because we just simply don't have the means to hire them in our own communities. Yeah, I could understand that. Now tell me, you work with a leadership, women's leadership group? Tell right. Me about that. Um, okay, so we'll go back a little bit to um, the college fund. When I was mm -hmm. at SIPI, I was awarded one of 20 um, scholarships for the Embry Native American Women's Leadership Program. And so I, along with 19 other uh, women from across the country who attended tribal colleges and universities, were awarded a scholarship. And it was a four year program. And during that time, we were able to, um, we did travel and, and were able to network, meet a lot of amazing people from Washington, D.C. to Honolulu, Hawaii. 
And um, along with the scholarship, we were also asked to do community projects. Um, and by community, that was either in our tribal community or our school community. Mm -hmm. And so we completed our four-year projects and um, scholarship program. And then the Embry Foundation gave an additional amount of money to the college fund so that the Embry program could continue. Ah. And so SIPI was fortunate enough to receive additional funding to have the Embry um, program continue at SIPI. So once I completed my Embry scholarship program, I then trans transferred to Northern Arizona University where I got my bachelor's degree and then also started graduate school. And so then um, when SIPI started their new program, then they hired me on as the mentor for the what we call second generation Embry oh, Women's okay. Leadership Program. And so now I mentor three young women who are students at SIPI um, through their scholarship program and their community project process. Mm -hmm. And are they from other parts of the country, from your reservation or where? There are, um, a couple of them are Diné, so they're okay. Navajo, mm -hmm. and then we've got one who is Pueblo, yes. Oh, nice, mm -hmm. nice. They can really relate. <laughs> yeah, and it's really nice for me to be able to really come full circle. So having uh -huh. been an Embry scholar myself, now to be able to share my experiences with new Embry scholars, mm -hmm. um, because we really, during the four-year process, we formed a sisterhood. The 20, 19 other women and myself really formed a sisterhood. Um, and we, we are able to now build off of our, our growth in those mm -hmm. four years now in, in seeing how far we've grown from um, achieving associate's degrees um, bachelor's degrees and some of them even were able to get their master's degree during our during our own program mm -hmm. process so now being able to help other young women with their you know drive towards whatever degree it is it, it's a it's a good feeling oh yeah of course that's great well, congratulations thank you now let's talk about your tribe okay now you've uh, lived pretty much all your life on the reservation, or your family has at least, right? Yeah, and I tell I, us about the tribe. What okay, it, so uh, Acoma Pueblo is about, like I said, 60 miles west of Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. um, we are one of the oldest continuously inhabited communities in the United States. Um, our traditional home is located on a mesa, um, which is separate from the villages where a majority of our community members live every day. Mm -hmm. And so at the Mesa, um, there's no running water, there's no electricity, and we still have families who live there year round. And so those families um, then are there, and most of them that live there, it is because they have, um, they serve a traditional role, or someone in their, com in their family serves a traditional role in our community. So they're part of the tribal council normally, the people uh, on the... That live there? No, they're not part of the tribal council, but they're they just... are religious leaders ah, in our okay. community. And mm -hmm. so um, besides our ancestral home at Acoma, we have villages, three villages, mm -hmm. where a majority of our community and tribal members live. Of course, because Albuquerque is so near, we also have you know mm -hmm. community members who live in Albuquerque as well. But um, a majority of us do live on reservation. Um, we have a, we have a public safety department, so we have you know uh, police and fire department. We've got a Bureau of Indian Education school um, on our reservation that serves um, grades kindergarten through eighth. Um, and so, of course, our tribal administration buildings are there. Um, we've got casino. Um, we've got um, Acoma land and big game hunts um, that are part of our economic development uh, corporation there as well. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we've got a variety. Uh, programs that our our tribe offers right there in Acoma. Where do the kids go to high school then? Do they go through eighth grade there? Well, they finish eighth grade there, and then we've got a couple of local schools that belong to the county, so okay. county schools um, that are maybe five and another 15 miles. So they bus? So they bus our children, okay. yes, for high school. Oh, okay. Now, how long has the casino been there? Oh gosh, um, we have the the longest standing casino. It's my understanding. Really? Yes, at Acoma at Sky City. It started out as a little bingo hall. Wow. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, um, so it's been around quite some time, and it's um, expanded obviously because now we've got um, a hotel mm -hmm. and the casino itself, um, and then we've got we we're one of the one of the tribes that doesn't have an expanded casino. So in other words, we don't have these other little satellite mm -hmm. smaller mm -hmm. casinos like some some pueblos do. 
but um, but we do have the. Um, it's located right off of Interstate 40, so it's easy access for. And there's for a restaurant guests. and everything there. Yes, there's a restaurant. <laughs> nice. there's, there's a travel center right across the street. Yes, exactly. Now, has it really benefited the tribe? The revenues for that have have helped the tribe in that they've been. Um, some of the funds have been returned for infrastructure, um, so like for use in the building of um, a Head Start mm -hmm. on our reservation um, for the younger children. So we do have a Head Start program there at Acoma okay. as well. Yeah, so it does it does return uh, some of its revenue back to the tribe for infrastructure. And housing has have you had generations there? I would assume. Yes, it's one of the oldest reservations, right? Right. So we we actually have a Pueblo of Acoma Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. And um, we do have um, government housing, so there are HUD homes on our reservation. Oh. Um, but we have a large majority of our families who live in family-owned homes that are, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. So they would be um, houses that were built, built of adobe or rock uh -huh. and then have just been um, kept by the families as the generations have gone by. How interesting. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a home that was owned by my grandparents that my grandfather built um, and then just recently moved into one of our, um, one of the HUD homes um, back in September. Um, and so ha now I'm living a different experience in a different kind of home um, there. And so right now the Pueblo of Acoma Housing Authority is working on a strategic development plan um, in terms of trying to see what the tribe can do in terms of housing for 5, 10, 20 years from now. Oh, wow. uh, so That's looking good. at um, possibilities of apartments perhaps mm -hmm. or assisted living facilities and things of that sort for our community Very members. Yes. Well, let's talk a little bit about on top of the Mesa. Okay. Uh, you said it has no electricity, right. no running water mm -hmm. and all of those things. And the, t tell us a little bit about the culture, cultural there, the homes, um, who lives there? Okay, um, so Acoma is a matrilineal society. So we have, families have homes there and in, in our community homes are passed down from mother to youngest daughter. And um, so the homes at Acoma are uh, multi-story, most of them are multi-story and um, a majority of them are multi-family homes. So in my case um, with my mother, um, she and her sisters have a home that was built by their father um, that is uh, tended and cared for by all of them and, and that will just continue to be passed down. Um, both of my parents are from Acoma, so I also have a home at Acoma or on the Mesa that is a family home of my father as well. And so one of the nice things about that is in, in, in cases of people like mine who are full Acoma, mm -hmm. you know, we are able to have two family homes up there yeah, as opposed yeah. to just one. So, um, but uh, like I said, mo it's primarily the religious leaders and their families who are required to live at Acoma for, uh, for their term of service to our community people. And, um, and so the no running water, the no electricity thing is just something that we're just used to. It's mm -hmm. not, um, you can't have Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There's, there's no laptops. There's no, you know. But it's something that, um, when you, when you're raised in the environment mm -hmm. and you're raised in the community, it, it doesn't seem any different yeah. to not have those things when we are up there. Right. And a majority of us spend our time there during um, religious ceremonies, um, you know, traditional celebrations that are held there, um, for uh, you know, seasonal ceremonies mm -hmm. that happen. Um, almost all of which are closed to non acomas Let's talk about that. That's, yeah. that's a little bit unique. Well, it, it does happen to, I mean, a lot of different uh, tribes, but that one is very unique in that there are certain ceremonies that the public can attend and some that are closed, right? Right. So explain that, how that works. So most of the, the ones that are closed to non acomas are, um, are religious ceremonies that happen uh, during seasonal mm -hmm. um, or parts of different parts of the season for the year. So we follow a seasonal calendar at Acoma, and so some of those ceremonies that happen, you know, are only for our Acoma people to witness and to participate in. Mm -hmm. And then we've got times um, like our annual feast day on September 2nd that's open to the public where um, visitors can come and um, watch our, our traditional dances Tell me and what things it is. like that. Tell me about the... <laughs> okay, so we have a harvest <laughs> dance. A harvest dance is our biggest dance that we have um, in September that um, we have two, um, two of our kivas, or our, our religious um, 
home bases that we call up there that participate. And so community members participate from either one side or the other, one kiva or the other, and um, can be hundreds of people at, at a time dancing um, mm -hmm. from either kiva. And so that is a time that that's one dance that visitors you know, are, are welcome to come and, and see. Now, where is it when they do the, the throwing of the... Oh, the, the food. Okay. And okay. So yeah. So <laughs> we have. Um, those okay. So um, annually, um, Acoma has um, an appointment system. So December 29th of every year, our tribal, um, our tribal administrators and our religious leaders are appointed by the Antelope Plan, and that happens every December 29th for the fall for the coming year. Ah, okay. And so. Um, in February of every year, we have a feast day that is open to the public in which we honor our new tribal officials and new religious leaders. And so during that time, as a uh, means of showing their gratitude, the family members of the appointed tribal leaders will um, throw, what we have call a throw. So literally it is taking food in baskets, um, for example, I own chips, um, things of that sort, uh -huh. and they and they will throw to those people that are present, and so that's just a means of you know uh, show, so showing gratitude. They literally throw. They literally throw okay. the food, right? <laughs> really? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That that's, that. Yeah, yeah. I've heard a lot it's about it. Well. Yeah, it's not even a figurative speech. It uh -huh. is literally done. Yes. Yeah, and they throw pottery. And yeah. So like it's that. a time for for our people um, that are going to be serving our community members to you know give thanks for. Kind of like a giveaway, but right? It's exactly. Away, no. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's really an it, it, it's an honor to have been uh -huh. selected by you know by our clan leaders to serve in that you know in that capacity, and so it's just a means of, of giving thanks for for that opportunity. Now, could we let's talk about your dress. And okay, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, can you stand up and tell us what you're wearing sure. and what it represents? Okay. Um, so go I've got on um, traditional clothes, Akama clothing. Um, a dress that I made myself. Oh, okay. I'm Beautiful. the mother of five girls, um, and with all of them wearing traditional dresses, I obviously had to some point learn how to <laughs> sew because we were going through quite a lot of dresses. But a long time ago, Akama women only wore what, this black, what we call a manta, and um, it was seen as uh, not being modest because, of course, it only covers one shoulder. And so during the time of colonization, um, you know, having one shoulder bare was not good, right? So we had to cover ourselves up. And so that meant putting on a dress underneath our manta. So that's like what I'm wearing now. And so we've got the sash that I wear as well, um, that women wear, and then along with our moccasins. So my moccasins are deer hide moccasins. And these um, types of shoes were worn um, throughout the year. Um, so even during the summer months when it was hot, um, these are the types of shoes that are wear. Nowadays, there's more contemporary um, types of clothing. Um, so sometimes for uh, events and ceremonies, we'll go without our manta and simply wear our uh, dress underneath with because the it's really hot with the sash. Exactly the because it's hot during right. the summer, right? But um, and then we'll have like lower cut moccasins without the wrap itself, but still be made of the of the deer hide, so just with a lower the, cut. From the ankle up, it's wrapped. Right, it's wrapped from the ankle up. So it's really a two. It, for the most part, there can be two parts. So it's the shoe itself and then the wrap from um, on top. Yes. And what do men wear? Men typically, well, it kind of depends, but men typically wear just your regular pants. But we'll have a shirt similar to my dress. Uh -huh. um, underneath and then just the shirt so they're not wearing an outer covering like the manta that we have uh, they don't typically wear the the outer outer one it'll just be a, a dress with um you know traditional color you know colors mm -hmm. of anybody's choosing really anymore um there are so many contemporary designs out there that um you know men are free to choose as well as women as to what we're wearing Thank you so much yeah. for showing that to us. It's just beautiful. Thank you. So do the girls pass them down? Or do you, they make you sew a new uh, um, regalia for each, <laughs> each of your daughters? <laughs> well, it, it depends. I've got daughters who um, don't always like to wear the same dress uh -huh. twice. <laughs> but, I, but they are handed down. So uh -huh. I do have um, dresses that belong like to my grandmother's. Um, I have mantas that belong to my grandmother's, shoes that belong to them as well, um, jewelry. So a lot of it is, yeah, is still handed oh, that's down. Nice. Right. That's nice. Um, so 
do you wear like if you have a weekend celebration do you normally change different um dresses throughout the weekend or do you wear the same dress throughout the weekend How it, it varies, it varies. It, yeah it varies you can there's nothing wrong with wearing the same yeah. thing um you know during the entire ceremony mm -hmm. um, but also again there's nothing that says that you can't change yeah, every yeah. yeah for every day oh that's really nice you have a lot of activities up there, huh? And it's 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 nice that you're keeping the tradition. Yes, we do. I, I come from a traditional family, so I was raised in um, in being uh, taught to the importance of participation, um, that the continuation of our traditional ceremonies and the customs that we have there, you know, are really what's going to carry us through and right. allow for us to teach to younger generation. And so, not participating almost equals not being able to know what to pass down. Right. And so, so you, you dance and your girls? Yes, I dance, my girls dance, my mother danced, uh, I do, yeah. my, my children do, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being here. It's really exciting to have you. We, we were looking forward to you coming and they were telling me time's almost up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really great to have you here. Thank you, Rose, and, I appreciate uh, it. Hope you'll come back again and spend more time I with hope us. so, I yes. do. Thank you so much for having me. But it was nice that you were able to come through Los Angeles, you know, and yeah. go to the, that event. And so next time there's an event out in California. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I know we've had your mom on the show and, and your aunties and... Um, and we're going to have the whole family on oh, eventually, good. right? Oh, That would be all wonderful. The, all the young kids. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll be sending them your way. <laughs> all right, that sounds good. But I need to tell you to make sure you log into nativevoicetv.org because Manu Martinez has been working very hard on the website, updating it with all the different locations uh, we air across the country. And there's so many, I can't even tell you where they're all at. I know there's... Hawaii and there's some back east and all over California. But I want to welcome our new station, which is from Fresno. It's CMAC 15, and that's in Fresno, a new station that will be airing Native Voice TV. So if you're in the Fresno area, tune in. But I know we're in so many different cities, and if you go to nativevoicetv.org, you can find out where we're at and how close we are to you, or if we're in your city. And if we're not we are on YouTube, so you can tune in on YouTube and catch us on Facebook because we're going to be posting all the pictures from before we started shooting. <laughs> we were acting goofy. No. <laughs> and you can see those pictures, too. So, again, I want to thank you for being here, Larissa. And uh, you, hopefully Rose. our weather isn't too cold compared to... <laughs> <laughs> it is a little bit. Well, it gets bit, kind of okay. warm over there, yes, doesn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. And on top, it gets even hotter, I yes. think. <laughs> and I've been there a few times, and it's really, really hot. hot. And that's one of the things I was noticing about your dress. Is it wool or? The manta is, it yes. It is. The manta huh? so is it has wool. to get hot mm -hmm. in the summertime. Yes, it does. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for joining us at Native Voice TV. And again, don't forget nativevoicetv.org or find us on Facebook or on YouTube. But. We'll see you again next week on Native Voice TV. Thank you for joining us. Good night. <laughs>